uh, yes, um, sit right where you are, don't move, here we go. Welcome to another episode of the Good Listening To Show, your life and times with me, Chris Grimes. The storytelling show that features The Clearing, where all good questions come to get asked and all good stories come to be told. And where all my guests have two things in common. They're all creative individuals and all with an interesting story to tell. There are some lovely storytelling metaphors. A clearing, a tree, a juicy storytelling exercise called 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, some alchemy, some gold, a cheeky bit of Shakespeare, and a cake. So it's all to play for. So yes, welcome to the Good Listening To Show, your life and times with me, Chris Grimes. Are you sitting comfortably? Then we shall begin. Hurrah! Welcome. So uh, if you... Thank you so much. That's not the end of the show. There is time for more. Welcome to those watching on YouTube and Facebook. It's billions of people. In truth, it's probably just a troll who's all set to set the world to rights in his pants in a few hours' time and a random sheep, a couple of squirrels and a stoat. But here we are, live in the room at the Slapstick Festival. This is the 19th... No, 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 19th Slapstick Festival. Good evening, latecomers. Please don't be at all embarrassed. Welcome and sit down. Um, so let's get on the open road. I do promise we're going to get you out of here. Now, there's a lovely bit of comedy slapstick in any case because Michael Palin starts bang on half eight and uh, Robin Ince is about to come on. I will give him a proper introduction shortly. Um, it's going to go one of two ways. Robin Ince and I would prefer to be carried out in triumph as we do a bit of crowd surfing as we go towards the other venue or we're going to get killed in... We're going to get stampeded to death. So it's going to go one of two ways, but I will get you out of here on time. So uh, thank you so much for being here for History in the Making. And again, sit back, relax and enjoy 45 minutes of storytelling with, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Robin Ince, writer, comedian, podcaster, super brain, slapstick constant, the MC of choice. Here he is, Robin Ince. Hello. <laughs> thank you, Chris. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I've written a new joke especially for you. Give Robin an ince and he'll speak for an hour. Off you go. I knew you'd know exactly what to do. So we're going to get you on the open road. Thank you for being here as I drop my hooter. And if we go down any rabbit holes, uh, this is a bell where I'll be going <coughs> rabbit hole number probably 478, please, Okay. in your case. Brilliant. And it's a real pleasure. This is quite a... You, obviously, you are the infinite monkey cage whisperer, obviously, of Brian Cox as well. And I've always really enjoyed it when he says you missed the point again on a subatomic yeah, yeah. level. Yep. No, yes. he is. Yeah, it's, it's one of those interesting... Because he's a very... Uh, he's only got two talents, which is understanding the universe and playing the piano. And so I have to then cover everything else, you know, which is a lot of... Uh, in fact, the one... There's an episode coming out very soon, which is my favourite, because I always like it when you suddenly see moments of weakness with him. And uh, he's terrified of spiders. And uh, ah. we did one with three live spiders, uh, an orb-weaving spider, a huntsman spider, and uh, St Andrew's cross spider. And uh, he genuinely was really, really nervous. And was that was the like, Australian episode? This that's the Australian in Sydney and we had this incredible time where when the, when the St Andrew's cross spider came out which was a really exciting spider so the female was right in the middle of the web and uh, and then the woman in charge uh, who's a brilliant spider expert she said I'm now going to introduce the male and then a whole audience of 500 people were suddenly up. We'd never had this on Monkey Cage before. Tremendously excited by the fact that they may well just about to see sex followed by extreme arachnid cannibalism. Wow. And, and everyone was like, oh my God. And then it turned out she wasn't interested. So nothing really happened. But it, when it came out on the frame, Brian just kind of went, I thought they were all going to be in a box. And I said, <laughs> they are. It's just we didn't say whether it would be open or closed. This one's open. And uh, yeah, it was, it was, and it also we had... One of the things about scientists is sometimes they take everything very, very literally and very, you know, on a kind of equation-based level. And so I knew that our spider expert would be fantastic because Brian in the sound check went, uh, oh, can I just check? So you're not actually originally from Australia, are you? She went, no, I'm from Austria, but we had to leave because of the chocolate famine. 
And Brian went, oh, I didn't know about the chocolate famine. <laughs> so I thought, yeah, this is going to be fun. <laughs> and next time, just get a praying mantis, because that will give you the sort of action of sort of sex followed by decapitation we also enjoy. Yeah, yeah, it is. It, it turns out as spectator sports go, it's mine of choice. <laughs> Thank you. So it's my absolute joy and pleasure. If I ever go like this... It's not because I'm trying to say cashier number three or rabbit hole number 400. It's just to move it along because sure. we've got 45 minutes. And it's my great pleasure. And by the way, I'm quite proud of that Simeon-like photograph as well, as the, you know, infinite monkey is out of his cage. And I also came to see you talk about your brilliant book, Bibliomaniac. And what was astonishing was you didn't talk about it at all. And this is at Bookhouse. And you did the most generous thing where, as your brain operates in this way, you were throwing out the most gener generous frisbees of other people's books. Well, that's what I love doing. Got onto your own. It's what almost all of my work is, I think, now, is I'm, I'm constantly making kind of... Uh, for those of you who are old enough, you remember when you used to make uh, compilation tapes for someone on a date, and you're like... And that's what I like... Basically what I'm doing, which is... There are so, like, I had a lovely moment just earlier where uh, there's, a, I don't know if you've seen here, there's a, there's a kind of shelf of library books you can take out. And there was a woman just looking at them and I suddenly noticed this magnificent novel called Stay With Me by Ayabami Adebayo, which is one of my favourite novels of the last 10 years. And I thought, I, I don't know this person, but I'm just going to go up there and go, hello, I've just seen you looking at the books. This one's absolutely fantastic. And then she turned and thought she went, I was hoping you'd come over. I'm totally lost. I've seen you before. Lead me through the books. And I love, you know, that bit of sharing. I think there is so much negativity in the world. I think there are so many people who are paid a large amount of money to sell spite and derision. And, we've, you know, we see that every single week. So what those of us who can have to do is go, here is the love and here is the joy and here is the, the laughter and here are some... Like, there's a movie called The Quiet Girl. Has anyone seen The Quiet Girl yet? Oh, it, it, what did you think? Oh, thank heavens. I, I was getting worried because there was a possibility that I, you'd go... Um, no, it was awful. <laughs> but, and then that was, but I, it was, for me, one of the most magnificent films that I've seen in the last ten years. And just full of love, isn't it, as well? Full of this. And so the moment I see something like that, I want to just tell everyone, you've got to see this. Before you go and see the next Marvel movie, go and see a quiet but beautiful film. And, uh, and so I, you know, and, like, and then another book that I bought the other day, I was at uh, Warwick Bookshop and uh, Morgan Paulini run it. Uh, they said, you must read this. It's called uh, A Short History of Queer Women. And it's basically just about, uh, sometimes it's been written out of history, women who've achieved remarkable things, uh, who were lesbians, and uh, it starts off with Sappho. And, and I just picked it up and I started reading it. And you know when a book's got so much momentum, you think you'll crash if you close it because it's just dragging you through at such speed and it's witty and... It's smart and it's just got so... And so the moment I read something like that, I, everyone must read this as well. You know, when you sometimes sit on a train and you look at what people are reading, and uh, or when, again, movies a lot of the time, you go, oh man, there's all these big budget movies that have gone through so many different... And then there's these little small films, which as you watch them, you can feel that tangible love. You can feel the pain that went into going, you know, making it. And so that's what I really... I feel that very strongly. More, I think the older I get the more that I feel that's what I need to do. Because also I think anyone here who is also someone who might sometimes struggle with you know, mental health issues and stuff like that, when you know what it's like to sometimes feel down and lost and all this, you are desperate to make sure that no one else feels like that as well. I know it was something, you know, Robin Williams, there's so many beautiful stories. When he, when he died, the number of people who said, oh, I've never told you this story, but... And there's a lovely story of him... Uh, he went into a donut shop and he sees this family and they're all sat there and they all just look a bit sad. And he buys his donuts and then he just goes over and he just says, oh, hi, you know, the, and it turns out it's the grandmother has died. And then he just keeps talking. And then slowly he goes into Robin Williams mode. And then by the end of it, the whole family are laughing. And, you know, the guy who said the story said that was the first time I saw my dad laugh since his mother had died. And it was like he couldn't bear, he, couldn't, he didn't want to leave. Mm. That table, seeing that sadness, thought, maybe I can turn something on here. Maybe I can do something. So what's really clear, then, is you're like a super connector. The book that goes just subterranean and is all the fungi that are connecting across the planet. When I experienced you doing your thing, frisbees of, you know, like fireflies of emotional intelligence, just bunging stuff out, it's incredibly generous and it just keeps on giving. And I was really struck with the fact that everybody watching it is going to remember something subtly different that resonates for them. But it's just this big... Oh, it's very nice of you to say, because I'd, I'd love doing it. It's like when I did... 
when we between tours with Brian Cox, we came back from Australia. We had just under three weeks where, where we weren't on tour, and then I went back to New Zealand. And I managed to fit in about 25 bookshops around the UK to just go and do talks in a couple of libraries and stuff. And someone said to me, God, don't you just want to sit down? And I was like, no. This is the energising thing of being in a room with people who love ideas. And the, and the ages are always so variable. You know, there'll be a nine-year-old in the audience, and there may well be, as there was the other night, there was someone who was 93. Mm -hmm. And there was, and, and you sometimes you look out and you're uncertain because we make rapid judgments on people, don't we? And, and then you go, actually, do you know what? They're all in a bookshop or they're all in a library. Mm -hmm. I can already throw some of those judgments away. And there was, like, the, I had this one talk where there was a 93-year-old in the front row and she had wonderful eyebrows, the most wonderful expressive eyebrows. And she started to basically conduct my talk because every time that I looked, whether she was quizzical or filled with joy or whatever it was, I would think, oh, I'm going to go down that route. She seems very, very interested in how Helen Sharman went into space. And I go, oh, no, I think now, quantum superposition, she's not interested in that at all, so I'm going to go off in another route. And then afterwards, she came up to me, and it was such a... She went, I'm 93 years old, and I just had to tell you that when I was younger, they made me uh, study languages, uh, two of them dead. And uh, then I was made to go and join the diplomatic corps, which I didn't really want to do. But now I'm 93, and I've always loved science, and I can do anything I want, so thank you. And I just, you know, I love this, the, again, that, that passion that had just not left her at all. So let me get you on the open road then. We're going to get the story behind the story. OK. You're on the open road anyway, and that's the wonderful thing. So I stand by my joke about I ask you one question and you'll keep talking, which is brilliant. Thank you so much. Uh, so the first construct is a clearing. So where is, what is a serious happy place for you, Robin? Where do you go to get clutter-free, inspirational and able to think? Well, one, I mean, I don't, I don't really have a place where I'm able to think because that's, it just goes on the whole time. It's very noisy in there. And, and it's always been a fascinating thing to me where once you start being able to be open about how your mind is, is what, what's going on with your mind, you start to find other people. Like one of my favourite things was uh, whenever uh, I've done a, a festivals and sometimes a, a, a parent will come up to me and say, my 12-year-old daughter just turned to me and said, that's what my head sounds like. And I think, oh, good. You know, I'm glad that they're, they're seeing that they're not alone. And, uh, and so the, I would say the place, like, it's like I did a show with my friend Carl, and this will link to the answer, right? Possibly. We'll Possibly. find out in a minute. Um, <laughs> I may be gay. Carl <laughs> is, uh, Carl, we, we did a show called Reality Tunnel, uh, two parts of a Radio 4, uh, where I talked about the way that our minds work internally, and then one about the way our minds uh, kind of deal with the external uh, situation. And, uh, and I talked so fast in that, that uh, Carl actually said, uh, oh my God, I'm trying to cut this down as much as possible to fit 28 minutes, but I can't lose 48 seconds. He said, there's 48 seconds. I just can't find what it's going to be. And he said, normally what I do is I just slightly speed it up and no one notices. He said, but I tried it with you he tried and that, you're already yes. talking at maximum speed for comprehension, <laughs> right? So, but Carl is one of the few people that I feel entirely comfortable with. He used to be an ice cream salesman in Blackburn Market. In fact, the BBC had to really beg him to, because he wrote some shows with Chris Addison that won awards. And they went, oh, co please come and work for us as a producer. And he went, no, I do ice creams on Wednesday and Saturday. And that, to me, is someone you can trust. Someone who doesn't want, you know... His boundary the, is yeah, clear. They don't want yeah. showbiz to get in the way of their Wednesday and Saturday ice cream selling in Blackburn Market. And... Um, and I just find with him, when it's, it, in a house in Levenshume that he lives, we just, we create a lot and I feel so comfortable. Like one of, this gives you a good example. When we were, there was one night where Brian was at the Albert Hall doing a special show celebrating 150 years of the Albert Hall with lords and ladies and celebrities. And then some other people I knew at the South Bank Show Awards. And I was with Carl in the Aldi in Burnage trying to work <laughs> out which bottle of rosé would go best with the film we might watch at one in the morning, right? <laughs> and at no point did I think, I can't believe it. Me, 53 years old in showbiz, all the awards, and I'm stuck here in an Aldi and Burnage. I really was going, this is where I'm meant to be. I'm meant to be with Carl, and we're there having this debate going, do we buy the bottle that's overly decorative, or is that disguising something? Is, there a, is the overly decorative nature of the bottle to say that the rosé will be very poor? And we took the risk, and actually it was both overly de decorative and delicious as well. And then we watched the first five <laughs> minutes of 40... Shut up! 40 minutes... <laughs> I, I returned to you. Uh, so the um, yeah, and we wa we watched the first forty minutes of of of, uh, of the first five minutes of about forty different Netflix specials and went nope 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 nope, and then we found one that was filled with love and joy. Anyway, shut your face. Next now. one, let's go. Um, 
we can take as a clearing then, outside the, outside the ice cream van, that would work, all the oldie car park, or do you want to be specific about where you're... Do you know what, if it's OK, I am going to be, we're going to be in the little room in the house in Levenshume, where we're sat, we've got a bottle of rosé there, Lovely. and Carl is playing me some Mark steel that he's Lovely. trying to work out how to edit with Mark's going. Another thing there about Stratford-upon-Avon, bloody annoying, right? <laughs> the one-way system of the Stratford... Yeah, that, so that's what we're yep. doing. Wonderful. So now we're in that clearing, wonderful, with a bottle of rosé just to the part there. I'm now going to arrive a bit existentially with a tree in your clearing, and we're going to shake your tree a bit, waiting for Godot esque to uh, get you to answer the construct 54321. Okay. So you've had five minutes, or as long as you've needed, since you agreed to say yes, and thank you for doing that. So four things that have shaped you, three things that have inspired you, two things that never fail to grab your attention, and this is a question that could be even designed for you. It's what are your random squirrels, well, squirrels, that never fail to distract you, whatever else is going on in your life. And then finally, a quirky or unusual fact about you we couldn't possibly know until you tell us. So it's over to you to sort of shake the canopy of your tree. There's some alchemy, some gold, some Shakespeare, and a cake coming as well. Right. So we've got a lot to cram in, in before we get carried out triumphantly to do a bit of audience surfing as we go to the next show. So... Shape me. You. So is that the first Four one? Four things talked? that have shaped you. Four things that have shaped me. Uh, one of the first would be uh, Alexi Sale. Uh, I could have also said Rick Mayo possibly, but when I was 11 years old, seeing Alexi Sale on OTT, uh, definitely suddenly just going, oh my God, this is, this is a possibility. I would say that is an absolutely enormous moment. You know, wine bars aren't good, wine bars because of all the people dining. Wine bars aren't good, wine bars because of all the people whining. Ever had a multiple orgasm? Yes, it made me sick. I once <laughs> loved a hamster bird, I killed it with a brick. Was a great song. <laughs> and uh, rumpty toodle, pina colada. A half a pound of muesli. <laughs> what do you think of Shirley Williams? I want to go to the toilet. Um, so that one, on, on a happy side, that was an enormous thing that shaped me. On, on a thing that is perhaps a, a, a slightly bleaker one, was that when... Uh, I'm allowed to do that as well, in terms oh, of the gosh, shape of things. It's yeah, yeah, not, yeah, it it's doesn't, meant to right. be existentially profound, not just right. fluffy, fluffy, the, fluffy uh, fluff. Well, when I was three years old, and I'm sorry if anyone's heard this story before, and I, I talked a bit about the book I wrote, I'm a joke and so are you. Um, just before I was three, I was in a car accident. Uh, it was a very short journey we were having. The, there was myself, one of my sisters uh, in the back, and my mum was driving the car, two and a half mile journey. And on that journey, there was a car that was uh, speeding and on the wrong side of the road, and it crashed into us. Uh, my sister got her head slightly cut open. I was fine, and my mum was severely injured. And she went into a coma. Uh, she only survived because my dad shouted at the ambulance people and said, you can't just take her to the local hospital. This is really catastrophic what she's faced. Um, and then when she woke up from the coma, she didn't realise that any of us existed because she'd woken up as an 18-year-old. Wow. So there were, you know, a lot of things and, and, and that led to a lot of battles that she had to have as well. She was a very good mother, by the way, I'll make that clear, but she also had a lot of battles. And because I was only, I was just about to be three years old, because of that, uh, I thought I'd cause the accident because when you're small you look at the world and when something terrible happens sometimes you think oh I've done that and certainly sometimes when you upset adults and all, you know I think it's a it's a very important thing there's my friend Philippa Perry who uh, people might know as a therapist and, and, and as an author she told me this very this brilliant thing once she said uh, if she sometimes sees an adult shouting at a child you know because sometimes we forget because a child is human shaped we think their brain is, you know, and of course, so much is, is, is going on. It's so different. And so you, you shout at a three-year-old as if they, you know, why do you put yoghurt on the window? You know, as if they've had some. Of course, they haven't had the process that anyone else would have had, you know, if you're an adult. And she said, if I see that kind of thing, then what I do is I go over. She said, if it's on a train, and I just turn to the adult, I say, are you OK? You look like you're having a bad day. And she says, more often than not, the adult then starts shouting at me but that means that the child sees that and says, oh, it's not just me. Mm -hmm. And it's a bit like, I think, I, did I mention Lem Cisse's book the other day when the, we, at uh, Bookhouse, I can't remember that. I can't remember either. There was, there was, uh, <laughs> sorry, I, I have no, one of my favourite things, I was chatting about this with Griff Rees jones actually uh, earlier on, because that's the kind of thing you do at Slap City, you just chat with Griff Rees jones and, uh, and just been having a pie with Rob Brydon. Yeah, that's the life. And, <laughs> and if he plays his cards right, I'll take him to the nearest Aldi as well. But um, it is... Uh, um, but yeah, the, the, uh, the, you see, now I've distracted, Lem Cisse, he talks about the fact that when he was sent from his foster parents to a care home, he thought it must have been something he'd done. 
And as the, the social worker was driving him to this care home, so he's been, been sent out of the, the, the house, you know, this was suddenly a total change, 12-year-old boy. And he must have just been sitting there going, oh, no, I must have done something wrong, and they, they don't want me in the house anymore. And, must, and, and his social worker pulled over the car and said, Lem, it's very important you know this, you haven't done anything wrong. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, I, and so, you know, those kind of stories, I think, are such important stories for people to, you know, for many of us, and I'm sure many people here, there are lots of things that have happened in our lives which sometimes we go, but that was years ago, whatever. And facing up and understanding why you've become who you've become. And mm -hmm. I certainly think, I mean, I, I, I briefly tried therapy, but I wasn't very good. If you, want, if you ever do want silence, therapy. I it was no good at all. And I was lucky because she had really interesting wallpaper. And I just... <laughs> I'd lie on the couch and i think, oh, no, I think I said that last week. Like, it was a gig. Like, you know, I go, uh, oh, no, I don't want to say that because it might make her feel unhappy about me. You know, so I had a, the trouble mm. is that I couldn't really talk about the things that I had because one of the things is being worried about upsetting so, people. So your relationship to silence then, were you not, a, you just were not silent through all the therapy you were receiving? I would, right? I just kind of, about 20 minutes in, I'd come up with something. Yeah. But I was always worrying about her. Uh -huh. Like, her stomach would rumble, and I'd think, is she eating? Is she OK? You know, all of yeah, this. Yeah. So I was terrible at therapy. But um, there was this one bit of therapy, which was... Uh, she was a very nice therapist, and she was smart. She really... She could see through some of the games that I was playing. But I had this horrible realisation of when... You know, when that, that, like your backstory, and you go, oh, what a cliché! And it was the fact that when, after the accident and when my mother finally came home, when she would... Because she suffered from depression and stuff, sometimes she would get very, very upset. And I, as the youngest, would go upstairs to her room and try and put on a show and make her feel happy. And it was like, and you just go, oh, God, that's my cliche. That's my, you know, that, that's my, you know, the thing is, and I think why I spend so much of my time being very worried about people being unhappy. And a real very... intent to people please is the sort of yeah. genesis of that always, even in riffing and making sure the 93 year old in the bookshop is getting the story she needs. There's this intention well, to... Well, I think now it's changed. I think now, because I have a greater understanding of... I was, I was very, very lucky, uh, you know, with many, many comedians and many people here as well. You may well have had that experience. Lockdown, I think, confronted us with our minds because we lost a lot of the distractions. We lost a lot of the ways that... And, of course, a lot of people have been diagnosed with kind of ADHD and other things like yeah. that. And, and when an autistic stranger called Jamie got in contact with me yeah. and said, could I talk about the neurodivergent model with you? I said, yeah. And, and that is a, a huge change for me. And I know that there's going to be a lot of people who will consider these things to be faddy and whatever it is, but I can honestly tell you that my life now is considerably better than it was two years ago. And even though I am always, I always worry about an audience. I'm worried that people are sat there now and some of you are thinking this is not what I thought it was going to be. And some of you are thinking, oh, geez, it's still another half an hour before we get to see Michael Palin. He'll cheer us up. You know, whatever it is. <laughs> but I don't have that nearly as much. And I've also realised that, you know, Brian, when we talk, will often go, why do you say that weird thing? That's really weird. That's weird. That's weird. And then I realised, well, that's actually been 50 years of my life life is people thinking I'm weird and me thinking I'm weird and now I am weird but it's okay because it's that's it's what I am embracing a superpower because you've had the label of ADHD which has yeah. helped you by someone well, it's just helped me understand it's given me a frame for the chaos of my mind so when your mind is just chaos and there's nothing holding it in I think that's where you can all get very negative thoughts and sometimes go down some quite bleak routes uh, but once you've got oh, this kind of case around your head and it says, so it doesn't matter what the definition is, that, that, uh, it, that isn't the important part. The important part is now having an understanding of like every single gig that I used to do, before I'd go on, I'd go, oh, today's going to be the really clever show that I'm going to do. And I, it's going to start off with a story probably about the artist Paul Arrego and then I'll tell and eventually that funny one about Heidegger. And everyone will go, what a clever man. And then, of course, I actually walk out and I go, oh, that's an amazing thing, actually, because I just looked at that exit sign there. And that reminded me, do you remember the public safety film that, uh, and blah, 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 yeah, blah, yeah. blah, blah. And then I walk off and I go, oh, I forgot to do any of the things. And then I get people coming up to me and they'll say, I've had this on numerous occasions. My husband and I made notes. Here are 17 stories you began and did not finish yeah. we would like you to finish at least five of them for some sense of closure so and uh, till I spoke to Jamie for him I suddenly went no one's been returning to my shows going we're gonna keep coming back until he manages a linear narrative <laughs> and then we don't have to come back they've actually been coming back because 
as much as I don't know what's going to happen in a show, they don't either. And suddenly realising that yeah. has really empowered me a, a, enormously. And suddenly realising there are certain people that I'm more comfortable with and suddenly realising also that you don't have to keep normalising yourself. And I think it's an enormous burden for a lot of people that they go, you know, I'm lucky because I'm in the performing arts and all that stuff. But for a lot of people in the different work environments they're in, they're really boxing themselves in. And there's this incredible flourishing mind that is not a mind that I, I think, you know, English social rules are really pretty unbearable. I think eventually we'll find out that the problem isn't ADHD, the problem is unbearable social rules. And that the world is, you know, all the art that we've been watching this weekend, all that slapstick, that doesn't come out of just linear thinking. That comes out of something wonderful and strange. Sort of kernels that, of creativity. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I think that's so important. I've got two more to go, haven't I? Uh, Doctor Who and uh, a hat. <laughs> so, okay. That was beautifully yeah. concise. I mean, Doctor, Doctor Who, Who with Doctor Who, I absolutely love, and, and I, I, I love the fact that it really reached out to, you know, again, everyone loved Doctor Who, but there was a certain love of Doctor Who that meant that you then were hanging around with the, you know, the kids who you could talk through that. So I would say that that is a very, very important part of it. And the hat? And the hat was entirely made up. I just saw a hat. <laughs> Very much like the usual suspects that moment there. I've just been using the clues there on the table. But I would, I mean, I would also say there's a, a, a lot of other comics and people that I've worked with. I mean, in fact, this is going to sound kind of trite, but a, a huge change in me before the other stuff was when my son was born, mm -hmm. which I was terrified of. And how I old really, is your son now? He's now 15 uh -huh. uh, and... And I, I remember, I don't know if anyone else had this, that, that like, I used to go to sleep when my wife was pregnant thinking, it's probably better that I die in my sleep because I don't know how to bring up a child. I'm probably better as a memory. So he goes, you never knew your father. He died in his sleep. <laughs> he was a wonderful man, as opposed to, there's your father, moving things he shouldn't and knocking stuff over. <laughs> and I, I remember being, and then of course, the moment it happens, and I, and I, and I, I love the adventures that, that we've had together. And I, you know, and, and I do think that really did expand the way that I looked at the world and the way that I thought about using time, you know, and the fact that, you know, like I, I do a lot of work, but I, I don't really have a social life because this is my social life. And then if I'm not working, I'll be at home. And, and, is go, your, and, and is your son very relatively like you and you both then exist? Because one of the ways you explained your process and how your mind works is the fact you just pour loads of stuff in and there's this most phenomenally brilliant quote about how it creates echoes within your mind and when you're not speaking and you can hear the echoes it comes out as interesting narrative to others it was something you said about yourself which was an amazing um, making sense of the way that your brain idiosyncratically works in order to have this con constant um, production of, of information. Yeah, he may well have a similar thing. He's since about the age of two, his teachers always went, he does talk a lot. Um, but yeah, and, and, and what I really, I mean, one of the things that I particularly love about him is, is also his compassion. You know, one of my, you know, when you see kids who are always getting ready to defend some of the other kids and stuff like that is something I think so important. As my friend Joel, Joel Morris, we were talking the other day, I'm just saying, you know, that, that whole, there are so many beautiful things that are, are made to be trite. While so many barbaric things are made to make, oh, what a brilliant person that person is because they write horrible things. And actually, you know, all of those things like love and kindness, which are turned into trite, are just amazing. The endorphin kick or whatever it is that you get. You know those moments where someone's done something kind for you or you've just helped someone or you've had, like when I got to Sheffield to go do a gig at the Public Library the other week, I, I was wearing a badge which uh, has a piece of artwork by someone wonderful called Cressida Campbell, whose sister is Nell Campbell from Rocky Horror Picture Show, amongst other things. And, and I'd helped someone get their case because the case had got caught up. She was a young woman and, and she said, oh, I like your badge. And we just had a little chat. And I said, oh, it's Cresta Campbell. And uh, I said, oh, where are you off? She said, oh, I've just left university. I've got a job in Grimsby. I said, I'll tell you somewhere in Grimsby. It's a really nice place to go. And we had this five-minute conversation about art and beauty and the fact that sometimes you go places where everyone will say it's rubbish. Mm -hmm. And that's just because they haven't looked at it properly. And then we will never see each other again. But I know that we both kind of left the train, like going, Oh, it's nice, it? So random acts of kindness and reciprocity, just the idea of being present and just giving yeah. however minute a gift might be, but just the idea of being able to be present to that opportunity. Yeah, and I think because we're scared so much of the time. Like, you know, I think not that long ago, I would not have gone up to the person who I presumed was a stranger looking at the library books. But I now think, what have I got to lose? If she just goes, you're a weirdo and a freak, well, she's correct. Mm -hmm. And... <laughs> 
And also, you know, and the fact that then she went, you know, more often than not, those moments, and you have to work them out. Obviously, I also know that as a middle-aged man, you know, if, for instance, if someone's opposite me reading a book on a train and it's a book I love, I probably won't say anything because I also understand there's tremendous, mm. you know, pressures and, and, and fears that people have. But in this situation, it felt like this was a safe area yeah. to do something like that. And even the universe you've created for yourself within your Cosmic Shambles network, you've just got this just proclivity of wanting to connect. Well, Which I just meet really so nice many freedom. brilliant... This is a thing that I really... I really... Um, as someone who is not, I don't think, socially adept in one way, I really do love meeting people who feel that they can drop their guard and just talk to you. And, and it's one of the most exciting... You know, you know some of the people who I've become friends with, a lot of them are people in the audience. It's like uh, Natalie K. Thatcher, who did the illustrations for, for my book. And I met her in the audience about 18 years ago, and we just stayed in contact, mm -hmm. and I knew she was brilliant. And then one day I could ring her up and say, hey, Natalie, do you want to illustrate my book? Yeah, I'd love to. And it's like all of those little moments that just started... I was talking about... I, I went to Weta. Um, does anyone know Weta, the, the special effects place from New Zealand, where uh, they do kind of Lord of the Rings and Wakanda Forever and all this stuff? And it, first of all, it was a wonderful place to go. We were in Wellington, New Zealand. Sometimes I did find it difficult because Brian is very different to me and the producer, I think, is very different to me. And so my haywire mind was I would get quite... That's weird, that's weird, that's weird. And then suddenly... I'm in this place where they make hobbits feet and animatronic heads and devil's antlers and swords. And everyone I looked at, I thought, I can talk to anyone here immediately. We've got a, just this conversation that's going to happen because everyone's like, oh, you're a widow freak. I'm a widow freak. Oh, this mate. Do you know about this? And they all have great T-shirts on. And there was a man there making a sword. And we had a long chat about that. Uh, and, um, and it was just that to be in that kind of environment and know that everyone can talk to each other. It's like when, you know, when you're at a festival, I hope it happens here. You know in certain festivals, in certain music festivals, you know that you could turn to any stranger and just say, oh, that was a really great event, wasn't it? I really enjoyed that. Are you a fan of? Because you feel safe mm. and you feel safe to share your love. I'm, and I'm also really struck with you've got a very good memory for these encounters. You're not just broadcasting and not receiving. It sounds like in, in remembering people from 18 years ago, you're actually getting something from it, but also retaining it. It's not just. Yeah. That. Yes. No, I, I'm always surprised by how much that goes on that suddenly a whole story comes out. Someone comes up to me and says, Do you remember me? You signed a book for me 17 years ago in Cheltenham. Mm. And I think, Bloody hell, that's a long shot. And then they'll say something, Do you remember uh, my sister lives in Dudley? And I go, Ah! Ah, and then the story comes back, you yeah. know. But what I loved, it, yeah, it was so, like there was one bit, it, there was this huge room in, in uh, Weta with loads of face masks of famous actors. So the life masks that have been used to make makeup. And obviously makeup artists, I think, do swaps because they weren't just people who'd done it. So, so there, were, there were three Vincent Prices of three generations. There was David Bowie's face from Man Who Fell to Earth for the makeup, the prosthetics he wore on that. There was Meryl Streep. There was the wrestler Tor Johnson from Plan 9 from Outer Space, Christopher Lee, all of these things. And I looked at the Peter Cushing one in particular because Peter Cushing's face, of course, is, you know immediately it's Peter Cushing when you see it on the wall. Such fine details. And I just looked at it, and the next day, Richard, who runs Weta, he came to the gig that I was doing with Brian, and he said, I've got something for you. And he gave me a cardboard box, and he'd had 3D printed Peter Cushing's face. And he said, because I noticed how you communicated with it, and I thought this would be something you'd want. And I thought, yeah. And, and then we had this conversation afterwards where we were talking about making friends with the audience. And he said, yeah, sometimes people say to us, God, you and your wife invite fans around. Aren't you worried they're going to be mad? And he said, well, no, we have a lot in common. He, he said, we've, we've just had two German We're women staying, yes. and we just, we'd been communicating about Lord of the Rings, and then they came to, and we said, come and stay with us. Because the thing is, my wife and I are huge fans of Lord of the Rings, and so are those two German women. Uh, the difference is, we actually did work on Lord of the Rings, but the main thing is, we have a huge amount in common. Because we love Tolkien and we love, and, you know, and I love all of those different things. And does the Peter Cushing mask have a, a special pride of place now? It's, I, I, I did have a mirror in my room, which I've not used since I was 31. And, uh, and I've now just put his face over the mirror. So when I go to turn the mirror, instead I'm Peter Cushing. Of course you are, rather wonderful. I'm in Whitstable, I'm taken straight to Whitstable. A cream Brother, tea. Lest we forget, it is your birthday tomorrow. You Indeed. are 54, 54 please. Tomorrow, so happy yeah. birthday for tomorrow. I made it!
<laughs> he said I never would. And by the way, anyone else who's seen any of the slapstick events, there's that brilliant montage at the beginning of all of the, the events. I'm happy to report we're both still here, which is yeah. the important thing. <laughs> so now I think we could be on to three things that inspire you now. And I forgot to mention, by the way, these are your storytelling apples that we're crunching on. Oh, OK. On. Don't eat it, it's a prop. Oh, yeah, you're so right. That's good. Did so you see my fear, by the way? One thing that's never changed is anything involving physical dexterity, like... Ah. Ah! Ah! You did good, and thank you for catching it. That's good. If you could have seen the panic, if that had been animated, Ardman would have run out of plasticine. Um, <laughs> so, inspirations. Yes. Uh, right, I'll start off with... I would say uh, Kurt Vonnegut is an inspiration. Um, because I think that the mixture that he had between going to war, understanding what he uh, had experienced and analysing it and the humanity, and I, I can repeat over and over again in my head that, God damn it, you've got to be kind. You know, that line from, I think it's God bless you, Mr Rosewater. Um, I went to the Kurt Vonnegut Museum and Library when I was in Indianapolis last year. It was the most wonderful space because it was not merely... I'm already annoyed, by the way, because I realised that I've started with Kurt Vonnegut and there's at least 17 other people that I want to do. So just count this as tonight's choice and already... Well, not even tonight's choice. Count it as the yes. choice till 20 past eight. The new choice at nine o'clock, ask me at the bar. Um, but I love that the passion he had... The, the vigour he had, the generosity he had, the way that he would express love to people. I, I did a thing with Bob Weedy, who has done some, some great, best known perhaps for Kirby Enthusiasm, but has made a great documentary about Kurt Vonnegut based on their friendship. And the letter that Kurt Vonnegut sent to him when uh, he and his wife got married and how much he loved seeing people in love. There's just a real beauty to it. And then the museum and library is wonderful because it is a space for people to work as well. So it's not just saying, do you remember the old man? Here are his old things. It's also about this is a space for people who don't have a space at home to write. This is a space to meet other people. And you know, I love that thing. Uh, the other one I'll go for is uh, Barry Crimmins. Now, do any of you know Barry Crimmins? Have any of you heard of Barry Crimmins? This is one of my drives, is to tell you about Barry Crimmins. Uh, <laughs> because Barry Crimmins was a really great human being. And uh, I, I'm going to warn you, I'm gonna, there is kind of a trigger warning in what I'm going to tell you, because he had something very terrible happen to him when he was a child. And um, I saw a movie called Call Me Lucky uh, about Barry. And I think even before that, I'd got, we'd started communicating back and forth. And you know, sometimes you don't even meet someone face to face. Just with emails, you go, oh, man, this connection is just there. Mm -hmm. Even though very different life and stuff. And Barry spent his whole life fighting for the bullied. He was a great comedian. He fought very hard for comedians' rights and stuff uh, on the Boston club scene. Uh, last time I was in Boston, I saw Stephen Wright, the wonderful, you know, surrealist one line and all that stuff. And Stephen absolutely adored Barry. In fact, you, you, Bobcat Goldthwait is the guy who made the movie about Barry. Barry, one, of the, one time I interviewed Barry for, for a book, and uh, we were talking about... Um, what are your, where do you decide not to go? Because, you know, we always hear that, oh, everyone's self-censoring and blah, blah, blah. And, and again, I think most of this is rubbish. I, I think you don't need to self-censor. But you do need, if you have free speech, you need to think about how you're using your free speech. Because what a waste of free speech if you just go, bleh. You know, the point is, go, I can say anything. So I'm going to think about what I'm going to say. And I asked Barry, I said, what don't you, and, and this was before he was diagnosed with cancer. I said, uh, I said, Barry, um, what don't you joke about? And he said, uh, I've never done jokes about cancer. He said, because I've never thought of a joke so funny that I wouldn't be worried afterwards that I'd reminded someone of someone they'd lost and made them sad, or I'd reminded someone of their own battles that they were having at the moment, or a battle for one of their friends or family. He said, and I, I never felt that I had, and I, that's what I think, like sometimes, as, as ideas are splurging out of my head, there will be a sudden break that comes which goes, hang on a minute, you need to analyse that one. Mm -hmm. Because I don't want anyone coming to a gig and feeling hurt. You know, in let, in let, you know they might so sometimes, if, if, it's, if I can argue and happily, without cognitive dissonance spinning in my head. And then Barry told me this story, which I thought was, and, and again, I'm kind of going to warn you about the language that I'm going to use here. Um, Barry was doing a gig, uh, I think it was in the Midwest, he was the headline comic. And uh, the, he just went on, and there was a couple in the front row who just loved him. 
Every minute the laughter got bigger and bigger. You know when sometimes you're in a crowd and there's a couple of people and they're laughing more than everyone else, but it's then carrying you along because their joy mm. is such a beautiful thing to experience, right? They just absolutely love Barry. And afterwards, Barry's at the bar and they come up and they say, Mr. Cremens, can I just say, oh, we had such a great night. It was so great. And he got talking to them. And, uh, and they said, yeah, you know what? It wasn't always easy tonight because it was, it was quite tough sometimes for us because uh, we don't come out very much. And he said, oh, okay. She said, in fact, we only come out about once a year because we have a child who has various disabilities and those disabilities are very complex and we only have one person we can get. And we, we the first act came on and each one of them kept saying, retard this mm -hmm. and retard that. And we just couldn't really feel comfortable. And then you came out and within two or three minutes, we got the measure of you and we knew what kind of person you were and we could suddenly feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, he said, Robin, you see, you always have to remember words are shrapnel. And you have to think about how you aim. And some people will report that as, can you believe it now we're not allowed to say that word? And you go, well, you are and you can, but why, why do you want to? You know, there's this story, I don't care the Roll Dahl book, I think fat's been removed from a couple of them, whatever, and everyone's up in arms. And I kind of, you know what, it's a pity when we have to sometimes change art and things move on or whatever. But in another way, there's really huge issues that we're dealing with now. And if you're focusing on, well, okay, it turns out you're not allowed to say that word anymore. Mm -hmm. It's a bit like, you know, those things when people say things like, I, I, the, when the Daily Telegraph had, which is not always great, uh, when the Daily Telegraph, even my dad stopped reading it and turned to the Guardian, <laughs> which was quite a, a an existential shock for him. And um, <laughs> fir first week it had a, an article about Hannah Gadsby and it would just change, you know, he's, he was, uh, he's still, he's 92 and he's still very open-minded and still interested in finding out things. Um, but yeah, and it was about the fact they said, oh, we might, it was a, a guy in, in, in the book trade who said, I worry that due to diversity, we may well not find the next John Grisham. Now, that's the wrong way around because the worry there to me is, have we missed the no next John Grisham because the next John Grisham wasn't a white guy. It was someone who was black, it was someone who was trans, it was a woman, it was whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, that, that, but it's always turned the other way around. What is actually hopefully a gain is turned into a loss. And that's obviously because of the dominant forces you have in... And in the other evening I was very struck with the idea that whatever you're doing in terms of what you're transmitting, it's to do it through a lens of love and kindness with good intentions. So the intention is always very, you know, integrity fueled. Yeah, that's why I really, I, I, I'm, I'm a lot more, you know, if I went back over, there's a lot of material I can look at in the past that I would never perform now. And yeah. I imagine that in five years time, I will probably yet again. So because that's, if you, you've got to keep moving all the time. Yeah, and it doesn't just mean about, oh, God, you've got to change with the times. And it, the, the thing is to be very conscious of why you're changing things. And that makes the world much more exciting. I don't want to live in the same world that existed in 1972 or 1985 or whatever it is. I want to live in a world where things are changing. And, you know, and, and I always find it great coming to somewhere like Bristol because Bristol feels like a very progressive city. I know I'm sure there's downsides and all matter, you know, like every place, but there does seem to be some real integrity. Like a lot of cities, you know, that there, there is that integrity that says we want to change things mm -hmm. and, and we want to, you know, we don't have, you don't have to just shut down every conversation as if it's some terrible moment of censorship. Yeah. You actually count it as right. Now let's work out what these words mean and why we want to change them. And now I'm going to throw something to you. I'm going to pass I it to you. I haven't done the third person yet. Easy. Uh, Paul Arago. Cashier number four, please. I'll just say Paul Arago because I think Paul Arago is an artist who I absolutely love and I love the fact that it was only really in late middle age that she became famous and that she became revered and she reminds us of the importance of tenacity in art and she also had an incredible mind and was beautifully inventive. She is one of many, I could also say Dorothea Tanning, and there are many other artists like that who I just find uh, beautiful and fascinating and brilliant. Thank you, Robin. And now this is um, a question that could be designed for you. This is where a couple of random squirrels come at you. So irrespective of anything else that's going on for you in the way that your brain works, what are your oh, squirrels borrowed from the film up? What never fails to grab your attention? Oh, squirrels, irrespective of anything else going on for you. Well, I would say one of them would probably, well, what it used to be is a negative thing, actually. The squirrel would be the critical voice that would freeze things. 
So generally things are moving quite fast, but a critical voice can jam stuff very, yeah. very quickly. So a mixture of a critical voice and a sense of melancholy are these kind of the squirrels of doom, ah, yes. which is actually something we all, I don't know where that came from. I was once walking through a wood with my son and my wife and we saw a squirrel and suddenly we went, they are the squirrels of doom. And you know when you just have, it's something that always stays with you. So every now and again, suddenly we'd be walking through the woods and go, I hear rustling, the squirrels of doom. Squirrels so that of would doom. be a, 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 a squirrel of doom. Um, I, I, I'll tell you another one which always distracts me. If I suddenly see someone reading a book, I have to know what they're reading. And, and I know I can't ask sometimes, and I see the spine, and I want to know what's going on in their mind. So that will freeze me in my tracks, because I want to know what movie's playing in their head. And you've definitely got the right title in Bibliomaniac, because it's almost this maniacal joy of all things literature, basically. I just, it, it's the quickest way to get into other people's minds. And it is, you know, and I just adore, it, it's like, I'm not a good reader. In my, I'm not one who sits down and goes, oh, I've finished the book. I, I'm all over the shop when I read. But I, it, again, one of the things that I'm going to keep uh, probably banging on about is the fact that now that I've started to deal with some of the anxiety that I've previously had and some of the other things, I find that I've got even more energy. This is why I would say to anyone who is worried about kind of the, 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 the state of their mind and, and what they should do next and whether they should actually be open about it, one of the things I will say personally is it has given me even more time because the negative voice is not there. And it, I never realised how tiring it was until you have a whole day where it's not there. Mm -hmm. And I remember being in London not that long ago, I went to a wonderful exhibition at, the, at Somerset House called The Horror Show. And, uh, and I was walking with my wife and my son, and I suddenly went, a bit like, you know, when they, you don't notice the supermarket music for the supermarket music's not there, was something people used to say, you know? And it, it was like, I suddenly went, oh, I've done the whole journey here, and we've got here, and we sat having a coffee. And I've not been worried about someone else's look towards me. I've not been worrying about what other people are thinking. I've not been worried about whether my shoes were squeaking the wrong way as I went through the quiet bit of the gallery or whatever it was. So you tamed and, the beast. And I thought, really it? felt this, it, it felt like a rush of energy to yes. go, oh yeah, I, there is a coat that I no longer wear very much. So it is the, the great release of the right diagnosis which helps you make sense of it. Yeah, 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 and it seems... And as everyone, I get so many messages from people who go, we've been telling you for 20 years! I've come to your shows for 20 years, why didn't you ever listen? But it required, you know, this guy Jamie, this autistic stranger, to get in contact, and somehow that conversation... Worked. And again, that's what I love, is by being open to him and not shutting it down, you know, and he's now someone that I like meeting up with, and he tells me a lot of different things about his world and what he needs, and it's it's just added more pictures. It's added again. We talked about this off stage before. It adds the layers. It's that yeah. palimpsest thing of going in every room. There's layer upon layer upon layer, story upon story upon story. So there is a bit of a time agenda that's about to happen. So oh, we yep. get a bit of a lift. Three minutes. There. Let's do it. So uh, a quirky or unusual fact about you, bish bash bosh, that we couldn't possibly know until you tell right. us. I don't know if I because when you said that, because I'm very honest, so I think nearly everything gets <laughs> gets gets released. Really? Uh, <laughs> generally, yeah. yeah. Uh, but right, this is. It wasn't my first murder. Oh no, hang on a minute, I'm not going to tell you that one. No, uh, I, this is a really horrible one I'm going to tell you. I very rarely use nail scissors. I uh, rip my fingernails. I know, I'm oh. sorry. Horror. And I don't know why, I just have, it's not like a deliberate thing. I, I, I just, I, I sit there and I do that and then I go, oh, Oh, so that's, uh, I'm really sorry it's an unpleasant, there are much worse ones than that. If I said I have a long stick in which I pick gunk out of my big toe, like Danny DeVito in yes. uh, <laughs> Always Sunny in Philadelphia, which is a masterpiece. And now, um, that's shaking your tree, alchemy and gold now, when you're happiest, at purpose and in flow, it's implicit in what you've been saying in any case, because it's about connection, but what are you absolutely happiest doing? It, it, do you know what? There is not a single answer to that because it is being in that flow state. It yeah. is that moment where, you know, where sometimes when I'm sat doing events over this weekend and I'm sat opposite someone whose work I hugely admire, there is this, you know, sometimes if I'm sat with someone like Alan Moore, who was one of the minds that shaped me in the work that he did on 2000 AD and on like that, and we're sat and having a pizza and we're talking about some kind of very idiosyncratic thing about HP Lovecraft or whatever it might be, uh, but actually, I mean, this is a weird transcendent moment that I have quite a lot, which is looking at a wall. And I don't know when it started, but because I try and see, I'm, I'm very desperate to find interesting things everywhere uh, and not go to a place and just go, that was a bit boring. And I was standing opposite Darling, in, in Darlington on platform one. You'll often find yourself standing there for longer than imagined uh, due to the collapse of our infrastructure. And um, there, there is this huge Victorian wall, huge. 
And I look at it, and sometimes I just get lost in it, thinking of all the hands that went into making the wall, and thinking about that structure, and thinking about the minds. So it will be something like that. It, and it, or it will be that moment where my son and I are looking at each other and we're both eating a knickerbocker glory and looking at the state of our face. Uh, you know, <laughs> and those, kind, those are the moments. So there's not a singular, I couldn't give you a singular answer. It's about a desire to be truly present and connected. Yes, constantly and, and, looking and it is something which in a year's time, this interview would probably be very, very different because I think it's still a thing that I, it, it's a huge change in me yeah, yeah. in the last two and a half years. But to the outside, I don't think people would even realise necessarily. That it's, it's not like the style of what I do has changed enormously. It's just that I, there's even more words than there used to be. Yep. But it was never, you know, there were never many pauses. That was one. Hurrah! <laughs> <laughs> and now, a cheeky bit of Shakespeare, and just to get a lick on, how would you most like to be remembered when all is said and done? Um, do you know what? I genuinely, when I say I don't care, I don't care about the meaning, but I, what I would like to be, if, if, if people want, because that's the interesting thing, is that this is where we still live, this is where the ghosts are, the ghosts are the memories that people have of you. And it would just be that those things where people go, oh, do you know what? I saw that thing and I had a chat with him afterwards and it was really helpful and I felt happier afterwards. You know, I, I had a, a thing, I was in Wolverhampton the other day and uh, this 24 year old came over to get her book signed. She was with her mum and, um, and then she just burst into tears and she'd been diagnosed uh, with ADHD and autism and she just wanted to say that the things that she had found mm -hmm. that had been useful, stuff that I'd done and my friend Josie Long had done and things. And it makes you feel uh, the happiness that she could express that. And I kept saying, it, it's crying's absolutely, you know, it's, don't feel any embarrassment. And it's like that bit of going, that was useful. I mean, it's like, well, sometimes people say comedy doesn't change anything, for instance, and that's bullshit, right? Comedy might not ultimately bring down the general or whatever, but there are so many, you know, I, I could talk about Josie, I could talk about Hannah Gadsby, I could talk uh, 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 about uh, Bridget Christie, I could talk about so many different comics that I know people have gone to see their work and there has been a connection that has been made and there has been this thing which is because we're allowed to allow the weirder thoughts out of our heads, sometimes people will hear those weirder thoughts and go, oh, I'm not the only one. And I think that is where comedy does change things and where, yeah. not just comedy, art as a whole. I, I really have such a short, like now, the number of people, every time I see comics punching down and making people who are already living their lives frequently as victims already and then they're being victimised as well by someone who's making $30 million and they're on Netflix and all of those things and I think, wow, that was what you wanted to do with your comedy? You wanted people to feel better about themselves by making sure they knew there were people that they could hate. And, and they say it's just jokes and it very rarely is, you know. And, and so that, that's why what my favourite comics, and some of them are quite dark, like Barry could be very, very dark. And he was certainly not, you know, if anyone wanted to say Snowflake or Woke or those other tedious cliches, he was a guy who lost a lot of work because he act, the people he aimed his barbs at were people with power. And people with power then don't put you on the telly. And, and, he was a, and I once asked him, I said, Barry, do you ever feel sad? You know, do you ever? He said, you know what, Robin? Kurt Vonnegut had a favourite joke of mine, and I consider that better to being, than being on Saturday Night Live. Oh, random squirrels, that means another random squirrel is coming. We are running out of time. Right, And thanks. finally, passing the golden baton, who in your network would you most like to pass the golden baton on to have a good listening to? Now you've experienced it from within, please. Right, I'll tell you what, my friend Grace Petrie. I think she would be very interested. She's a brilliant folk singer. She's a brilliant activist. Uh, she's a human being with a lot of stories to tell. So I think Grace Petrie. Grace Petrie. There is so, so much more that we could be talking about, but we are running out of time because no, 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 of we people have. needing to yeah. get into the Michael What's Palin. What's great is we've set up an alibi. So I can pretend to myself <laughs> they're all going because it's Michael Palin, but they may not have tickets to Michael Palin. They're just going, oh, well, at least it looks like we're leaving for a reason as opposed to the reason yes. of, oh my God, it's still going on. So lest we get killed in a stampede, we are now going to be carried majestically aloft as we crowd surf to the next venue. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. You've been given cards. Do give some feedback to what you thought about this construct. You have been listening to the polymath, becardigand, awesome pants that is Mr. Robin Ince. Thank and you Chris. Let's hear Chris as well. <laughs> thank you very much indeed. <laughs> And thank you for watching on Facebook and YouTube as well. Thank you. Thank you. I hope that was all right. I hope it wasn't too serious. No, tickety-boo. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you.